Uh, the last bill on our agenda today is House File 3465 from uh, Representative Long. Representative Long, to your bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate uh, you having me before the committee today. Uh, House File 3465, I believe, is a simple but powerful bill. It would require insurance coverage of infertility treatment considered medically necessary by a health care provider. I am introducing this bill on behalf of constituents who approached me with their fertility challenges. My constituent wrote, my wife and I are in the midst of infertility treatments and even with the best coverage and our decent salaries, we are being denied coverage and the expense of treatment so that we can begin our family is an overwhelming and disheartening mountain to climb. Currently, my insurer caps our lifetime benefits at $10,000 making any infertility treatments not covered in any way, shape, or form. This requires that one be wealthy in order to start a family. This story is not uncommon. Currently, fertility treatment is limited to those fortunate enough to be able to afford it or who go into debt or raise money for those expenses. My wife and I are fortunate to have two amazing children, uh, three and five years old, who are the best things in our lives. I know that fertility challenges are not rare and they are often private struggles. Approximately 10% of all women have received some assistance for infertility. That's why 17 states, red and blue, from all parts of the country, have passed laws requiring insurers to cover uh, for in infertility diagnosis and treatment. This includes states like Arkansas, Louisiana, Montana, Ohio, Texas, West Virginia. This bill would have Minnesota join these states in providing needed medical coverage, and more importantly, in providing hope to so many Minnesota families. And Mr. Chair, I have uh, three testifiers I've invited today, uh, Andy and Rachel Wilkie and Mariah Grant, and I'd like to turn it over to them now to share their stories. Certainly, uh, we can start with Andy and Rachel Wilkie. To the Wilkies. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for allowing us to testify today in support of requiring infertility treatments like IVF as outlined in House File 3465. My name is Andy Wilkie. I'm here with my wife, Rachel. We're joining you from Mankato. Our infertility story began after trying to conceive the old-fashioned way. After more than a year and no success, we sought treatment with a doctor who uh, is a fertility specialist. We endured another year of countless tests and treatments. Nothing was successful. After a major surgery, I was diagnosed with endometriosis, which took a significant toll on my physical health. After that came more tests, treatments, poking and prodding. Infertility is a silent diagnosis. The impact it had on our mental health is immeasurable. It was filled with self-blame, guilt, shame that continues to affect us to this day. We both felt so alone, broken, and hopeless. We had our daughter's name picked out the day we got married. Our dreams of creating her and our future family were slowly slipping away. We had one last option remaining. IVF. We connected with another doctor specializing in IVF that explained to us that the chance of success was still only a little better than 50%. The other big obstacle was financial. We had already spent thousands of dollars on deductibles and co-pays, but we soon learned that my employer-sponsored insurance plan would not cover IVF. Having already maxed out two credit cards, we knew we needed cash to move forward. We ended up taking out a personal loan of $25,000. Infertility is not covered by insurance because it's often seen as a women's issue. However, in the case of infertility, nearly half of all cases are due to male factor infertility. Globally, one in eight couples struggle with infertility. Approximately 12% of American women have difficulty becoming pregnant, making infertility roughly as common as diabetes. Over the course of 40 years, there have been more than 8 million births as a result of IVF. That's 8 million children brought into this world to parents who want so desperately to start a family, they endure immense pain, uncertainty, and financial distress. We, you as elected officials have a responsibility to, divide, to define our values as a state and codify them into law. Use that awesome power to give Minnesota families the opportunity to feel the pure joy of parenthood. Our story is painful and still raw. But unlike so many, it has a happy ending. In 2017, after three years of trying, I gave birth to our little girl because of IVF. And again, this year, we had our little boy, again, because of IVF. Our family feels whole and our hearts are mending through the trauma we all endured. 
We're grateful for the medical technology available to make our dreams come true. We want more families in Minnesota to get the same chance we had without significant financial burden. Thank you, Chair Stevenson, for allowing us to share our story today. Too many couples feel ashamed or embarrassed to talk about infertility. We're happy to share our story in an effort to help more Minnesota couples become parents. Thank you, Representative Long, for offering this bill. We urge the committee to support House File 3465. Well, thank you both for coming today. And I think you hit the nail on the head uh, on the end in particular, which is that this is a story that is often difficult for people to tell. And I really appreciate you uh, being willing to come to the committee and, and telling it. And I'm, I'm certainly uh, glad that your story has, as you put it, a happy ending and, and congratulations uh, on that. Uh, the next testifier is Mariah Grand. Ms. Grand. Thank you, Chairman Stevenson and members of the committee. My name is Mariah Grand. I'm a born and raised citizen of the great state of Minnesota, a U of M graduate, an operations analyst, and my husband and I have endured the brutality of infertility for the past seven years. As a child, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, my answer was always a mother. In 2015, my husband and I decided to start a family. What followed was a diagnosis of male and female factor infertility, multitudes of tests, seven invasive infertility treatments, and six heart-wrenching miscarriages that came with the unimaginable price of $102,000. We were forced to take out a second mortgage on our home. I have great health insurance, but I was denied coverage for treatment of my infertility, which is a disease as defined by the World Health Organization. The horrific pain of infertility is devastating. Studies have shown that women with infertility can have the same levels of anxiety and depression as women with a cancer diagnosis. To add to the horror, we were crushed financially. In 2019, we looked to adoption, only to discover that path was just as emotionally, mentally, and financially taxing as infertility treatment. So with the encouragement of our family, we went to see a specialist who had a new solution for treating our disease. By this time, we had exhausted all of our means financially. So my sisters organized a fundraiser, and with the love of family and friends, we raised $22,000 for a final round of IVF. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine needing to throw a bake sale to have a baby. A year and a half later, in February of 2021, Isla Gertrude Gran was born, healthy as can be. One in eight couples from, suffer from infertility, as you just heard. That equates to 115,000 Minnesotans. We all know someone who is afflicted with this disease. Please give those suffering from infertility the family building opportunities they deserve and pass HF 3465 to bring infertility coverage to Minnesotans who are suffering, suffering like me. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Grant. And <clears throat> as I said to the Wilkies, I, I appreciate uh, the time and encourage to come here and share uh, your story. And I'm also uh, grateful for the, the happy ending. Uh, the last testifier who signed up is Laura Beth Elm, Ms. Elm. Ms. Bell, Elm, we cannot hear you. You're not muted, but um, still not getting you. I'm going to suggest that perhaps if you try to log out and log back in, or perhaps from a different device, that that might be worthwhile. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I'm going to go to uh, the first member, but I will come back to you after, in between each member that talks to see if we can get you in. But I, I would suggest that you try and log out and log in or, or try a different device because we're not hearing you currently uh, on, on the device you're on right now. Just can you hear me? Oh, now we can. Now we can. Ms. All Elm, right. You know, sometimes there's like triple muting and I think I've got the right microphone going, but I was wrong. So I appreciate your patience. Thank you so much. Um, Chair Stevenson, um, is it all right if I continue? Please do. Okay, thank you. Chair Stevenson and members of the committee, my name is Laura Elm and I'm here today to oppose HF 3465. I previously worked at a health services company and supported a benefit for IVF coverage. I witnessed the fertility industry from the inside and detected many flaws. The suffering of infertility is real and unfortunately horribly widespread. Access to effective, affordable treatments should be encouraged. However, as this bill is primarily concerned with the coverage of IVF, 
that is the generation of living human embryos in a lab, it's necessary to look at some of the IVF industry's critical failings. First, the reported IVF success measures omit a critical variable, and that's the number of embryos created. This lack of transparency is a disservice to prospective patients and opens the door for unscrupulous lab practices. Secondly, we don't know how many embryonic human beings are already in frozen storage in labs and warehouses. It could be a million in the United States, or it could be a million just in Minneapolis. This is a known industry problem that mandates like these exacerbate. The third failure is that the informed consent process often fails to cover basic yet critical patient education. Prospective patients have a right to know, for example, what an embryo is, that they can talk with their provider about limiting the number of embryos created, and that there are many reasons why their embryos may die in the lab. And finally, there are almost daily news stories of tragedies concerning patients whose embryos were lost, destroyed, or mixed up and transferred to the wrong family. Before we require insurance plans to cover IVF, we must first recognize the industry's failings and I hope put reform plans in place to address them. Thank you for letting me share today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Elm. We'll now move uh, to member discussion. It is uh, 10 11 right now. I am going to adjourn this committee at 10 20 at the latest to give members a chance to uh, get ready for our floor session at 11. Uh, Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I appreciate all the testifiers sharing uh, their stories here today and having this conversation. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to uh, recommend to the bill author, if he already hasn't, to um, try to get this submitted for the mandated health benefit review process um, so we can get uh, some information analysis back hopefully for next session on uh, what the uh, cost of this would be for um, the, the health insurance plans and for premiums. And I also think it would be helpful to, to understand what the cost would be. I know the, the bill before the committee does not apply to state public programs, but I do think it would be helpful to understand what those costs would be if this mandate were extended to insurance products that are subsidized by the state. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. Uh, Representative Wong, did you want to speak to that? You unmuted yourself. I did, yes. Uh, thank you, Representative Rasmussen, for the suggestion that that is my intent to submit it for uh, review this fall. Well, you know, uh, the way to submit for review is to let the chair of the Commerce Committee know you want it reviewed, and I think you just did. So, Mr. Uh, chair, would you, would you please uh, consider this for review? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Brown, would you please submit this file to the Commerce Department for uh, review? Will do. Uh, sure. Thank you. All right. It's been submitted. Uh, uh, Representative Katiza Watun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Long, for bringing this bill forward. It is, it is such an important um, part of the conversation that we, um, it's really necessary to bring forward because it, it is such a um, painful and often really private um, suffering that, that, um, individuals and couples go through. Um, my husband and I suffered from infertility um, for years. <laughs> and uh, you people may not believe that when they find out that um, we have four children, our, our older three children are adopted out of the foster care system. Um, I, I will touch a little bit more on fertility, but it would be remiss. Um, I would be remiss to not share um, even one of our testifiers mentioned about how um, expensive and difficult private adoption can be, that the state of Minnesota has a program called the Waiting Child Program. Um, children who are legally eligible for adoption um, after their parental rights have been terminated and the state does help um, with all the fees involved in that. So um, for anyone watching today who is open to foster care and adoption, um, they should definitely check out that path because it is um, much more financially accessible. Um, but I have um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which led to some difficulty um, for us to conceive. And um, we went through a number of intrauterine insemination um, processes. Uh, so we didn't go all the way to IVF. Um, a big part of that reason was financial, um, but it just it becomes um, emotionally taxing as well as financially taxing and just felt like we were kind of flushing money down the drain. And so um, I think I know that um, some employers have begun um, to cover uh, different fertility treatments for their employees, um, which is 
so wonderful. Um, different employers have begun to cover uh, some of the costs of adoption, which is also wonderful. Um, I think for people who don't have access to that, that, that this is um, a step in the right direction and that we can continue having this um, conversation. And uh, there's, there's so many facets that we need to, to look at in order to help people um, create or, or build the families that they've always dreamed of and to make sure that every child in, in Minnesota has a safe and um, loving family to call home. Thank you, Representative Kutizo Uh Representative Tice. Uh, Representative Tice. Uh, I just have a, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a quick comment for um, <laughs> Representative Long. Uh, what I'm not seeing here is something to support the couples in the counseling mental health realm. I would like to see that as well. Uh, in our family, we have a couple who went through years trying to, to conceive a child. And after they finally got the child, they just, their, their relationship was so damaged that they ended up uh, not being together. So everybody talks about, and, and I know we've seen it from everyone, how, how hard this is to go through, but um, it would be nice to see some support for them uh, in that way as well. I know a couple of them have mentioned it, but. Uh, if we're going to do this, I think that we need to do it uh, right and have support for them for all their needs, not just physical. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tice. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I guess at this point, just wanted to echo uh, what most of the, the previous uh, members have already said. Uh, and I want to thank the, the testifiers for coming forward and sharing their very personal stories. So uh, I got married at 19. And we have been trying to have kids for over 20 years uh, unsuccessfully. And we've traveled the, the infertility continuum from the easy stuff all the way up to IVF. So I can tell you from uh, personal experience, we've done IVF twice. And I've shared this in other committees before, but not in this committee. But uh, uh, endometriosis, yep, very familiar with that. Uh, that is the, um, the infliction that we have as well. And uh, it is very cost prohibitive uh, in the States. I think IVF, at least when we last did it, it was uh, about $25,000, it's probably more now, uh, but we had to go internationally in order to save money. So believe it or not, we had to travel to other countries in order to try to save money. And even then it was still uh, cost prohibitive. And so, yes, this is a, a very important conversation. There are many that are inflicted with this and I don't remember who said it, but absolutely uh, this does create a significant toll on, on parents that are trying to have children with, with depression and, and feelings of, of regret and, and all of that. So this is a very sensitive topic. It's a very important topic. And, and unfortunately, there are way too many that are suffering with this. So thank you for this conversation. Thank you, uh, Representative uh, Lucero. Uh, Representative Tice, your, your hand's back up. I don't know if you were, oh, and now it's down. Okay. Well, I see no members uh, uh, wishing uh, further recognition. Uh, Representative Long, any closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, thank uh, Andy and Rachel and Mariah for, for sharing their stories and uh, Representative Katisa Wachun and Representative Lucero as well for, for sharing theirs. I think these uh, matters are often, as I said, personal and um, often we don't recognize how commonplace they are are for these diagnoses and other medical conditions that we're trying to solve uh, here. And so I do I hope that this bill uh, can advance. I appreciate the members' uh, uh, consideration today and appreciate um, all of uh, the individuals who took time to tell their, their personal stories. Um, I hope, I know that that will matter uh, to moving this process forward. Thank you, uh, Representative Long, and, and I want to uh, share in your uh, thanks to the, the members and, and the testifiers, uh, again, for sharing uh, their stories, and uh, I think it, it, it is only helpful to, to hear people uh, talk openly about the struggles that they've had and hopes that we can try and find better solutions. 